So good afternoon once again and welcome to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for the public seminar on technology, technology and innovation, which is our last for the year. To formally begin our event, may I call on our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for the opening remarks. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Uh, I know we're a bit sad today because our candidate uh, <laughs> for Miss Universe did not make it to the top 10. Uh, but um, we're glad that you're all here. So um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our colleagues from the government, uh, representatives from the academe, civil society, and the private sector. Um, today's event is interesting and timely because it will feature three PIDS studies on technology and innovation, um, namely issues on digital trade by our PIDS fellow, Dr. Monette Serafica and Dr. Albert, um, e-finance in the Philippines status and prospects for digital financial inclusion by former PIDS president, Gilbert Llanto, and um, our senior research uh, associates, um, um, Maureen Ann Roselion and Tina Ortiz, unfortunately Tina is on study leave and Dr. Um, Yanto um, has another uh, commitment today. And uh, finally, the third paper, E-Education in the Philippines, the case of Technical Education and Skills Development Authority online program by um, our fellow Dr. Kimba um, and the research analyst Silwin Kalizo and um, our consultant, Ms. Kabuatan and Ms. Pasho. Uh, the paper of Dr. Serafica and Dr. Albert will discuss how innovation and technology has opened the door to digital trade and e-commerce and the subsequent challenges. Um, it also suggests strategies, policies, and activities that the Philippines can pursue to keep up with technological advances and take advantage of the opportunities of digital trade. Um, on the other hand, the study of Dr. Yanto, Maureen, and Tina tried to examine the contribution of technology to financial inclusion in the Philippines and analyzed whether e-finance has enabled the last mile consumers to avail of financial products and services affordab affordably and conveniently. And the paper also probed into the experience and concerns of digital finance users and presents recommendations to improve provision and use of digital financial products and services. And finally, the paper of Dr. Kim by his co-authors assessed how information and communications technology has enabled Filipinos to have access to online technical evaluation, technical education offered free by TESDA online program. Um, I encourage all of you, TESDA actually offers uh, huge variety of, of courses and um, I don't think many of us have actually taken advantage of this. Um, so we hope to enlighten you on these topics and we look forward to hearing your insights during the open forum. So again, good afternoon and thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Mamsel. So let me introduce to you our first presenter this afternoon. She is a senior research fellow here at PIDS. Before joining the Institute, she was an advisor at the Australia-Indonesia Partnership for Economic Governance in Jakarta, a former senior analyst at the APEC Policy Support Unit in Singapore, and was a team leader, research manager of the Regional Economic Policy Support Facility at the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta. She also taught at uh, De La Salle, uh, Manila as associate professor and was also industry economist and technical staff at Smart Communications and SGV Consulting, um, respectively. She obtained her PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. Friends, let us all welcome Dr. Ramonet Serafica. So, uh, magandang hapon po. Uh, pasensya na po wala si Dr. Albert. So, sisikapin kong sagutin ang tanong nyo, pero pag mahirap, <laughs> ibabato natin sa kanya. So, um, the presentation this afternoon is based on a discussion paper that Dr. Albert and I prepared last year. And where uh, available, some of the data have been updated. 
Okay, so before I present the outline of my presentation, I want to briefly talk about the motivation behind the study. So it has been observed that globalization has taken a different form. Specifically, globalization has gone digital. Whereas the 20th century global economy was shaped by significant flows of physical goods, the global economy today is increasingly about intangibles and services, specifically defined by flows of data and information leading to a more digital form of globalization. So the figure you have here uh, shows that cross-border data have grown 45 times from 2005 to 2014, and it is projected to accelerate further as digital flows of commerce, information, searches, video, communication, and intercompany traffic continues to surge. So we know that driving the transformation, the digital transformation, are a number of technologies that are listed here. In the Philippine Development Plan, digital trade and e-commerce are included as part of, the, of developing high-value added competitive and sustainable sectors. So while e-commerce is uh, or has already been mainstreamed in the national agenda with the formulation of the Philippine e-commerce roadmap, the concept of digital trade is relatively new. So uh, given this, it was necessary to have a better handle on the concept of digital trade and what it means for the Philippines. So uh, the main purpose of our issues paper is to gain a deeper understanding of this new form of, tra of trade including its implications for policy and research. So specifically, we wanted to examine the scope of digital trade, present available estimates of digital trade, uh, hopefully, or uh, if possible, for the Philippines, identify the opportunities and challenges for our country, and then recommend areas for further study. So uh, my presentation this afternoon will go through each of these topics. So first is on the scope of digital trade. Okay, so although there is no single or standard definition of digital trade to date, the concept of e-commerce is a useful starting point. So the WTO defined uh, e-commerce as the production, distribution, marketing, sale, or delivery of goods and services by electronic means. In the Philippines, uh, e-commerce is defined for statistical uh, purposes following the OECD broad definition. So it is the sale or purchase of goods and services between businesses, households, individuals, governments, and other organizations conducted over computer-mediated networks. So the goods and services are ordered or over those networks, but the payment and the ultimate delivery of the good or service may be conducted on or offline. So digital trade uh, builds on the concept of e-commerce to include the latest digital innovations and, uh, and obviously because we are interested in trade, there has to be a cross-border element. Uh, leading international trade economist uh, Alan Deardorff describes international digital trade as commerce involving more than one country for which the product itself is digital and or any of the following are accomplished at least in part by using the internet or a similar digital technology. So advertising, ordering, delivering, payment, or servicing. And then he further enumerates the different types of digital trade as shown in this slide. Uh, Lopez, Gonzalez, and Juan Jean, I, I hope I pronounced it correctly, argue that what we are really witnessing is the rise of digitally enabled trade. So this has emerged due to several factors, such as reductions in transport and coordination costs, as well as the falling cost of connectivity and information transfer. So while there is no uh, single recognized and accepted definition of digital trade, there is growing consensus that it encompasses digitally enabled transactions in trade in goods and services. And later there's a, another component. So this is, um, based on our, our search of the literature, this seems to be the emerging conceptual framework of uh, digital trade. So it is composed of three dimensions. One is uh, the nature of the transaction or how. The second component would be the product, what is being traded. And then the third component is the partners or who are involved in the digital transaction. 
So uh, again, it covers all cross-border resident and non-resident transactions to be considered trade that are digitally ordered or and or platform enabled and or digitally delivered. So there's an, there could be an overlap across these different types of transactions. So let's uh, go through each component. So the first component of the framework involves the how and to distinguish between digital and non-digital cross-border transactions. So the first type is digitally ordered and uh, you will notice that this is just a typical e-commerce transaction but with the additional requirement that it involve a cross-border element. So the transaction can be between enterprises, households, individuals, governments, and other public or private organizations. The second uh, how or type of trans transaction are the platform-enabled types. So we are familiar with, with this. These are transactions that involve intermediary platforms such as uh, Amazon, Grab, Alibaba, or Airbnb. Now, uh, there's a little uh, sort of complication or challenge when studying platforms because, uh, for example, it is not always clear where the intermediary resides. So raising uncertainties about whether the underlying transactions are recorded as cross-border trade or as income flows. So in addition, even if there is clarity on the residence, it is not always clear whether cross-border transactions should be recorded or as gross, uh, including the value of the underlying service or good provided, or as net. So just uh, extracting the intermediation fee. So here's an example in the case of a ride-sharing service, where the consumer and driver, uh, the one who provides the service, both reside in the same country. So we know that uh, traditionally, taxi services are not tradable, right? So in the physical world, ta a taxi would pass in front of a customer who would pay for the ride in cash or card in other countries. And the ride-sharing matching platforms adds a new tradable digital service, enabling the transaction by matching the driver and the customer and managing payment. So the transaction between the driver and the rider takes place in a partic particular country but the supporting transactions, the provision of matching services, payments and insurance cover, if any, are potentially provided from another country, and that is the trade component. There are other platforms where um, the, the company could be based in the same country as the seller or the, uh, or the consumer, but the other party is now in another uh, jurisdiction. So in that case, it's quite clear that there is trade. So for example, in online labor markets. But um, I think what we wanted to emphasize is this is a complicated sort of arrangement in terms of understanding uh, trade and income flows. Now the third type is the digitally delivered uh, type of uh, transaction. So it captures those services and data flows that are delivered digitally as downloadable products. So software, ebooks, data, and database services. So uh, the second dimension of the framework uh, looks at the product involved, whether it's goods, services, and data. So we are familiar with trade in goods, we're familiar with trade in services. Now there's a, another complication because under, under digital trade, it also includes trade in information and data. So what are the statistical challenges? Um, definitely data flows present the biggest measurement challenge for digital trade. In many cases, the data flows do not result in monetary transaction per se, but uh, they may support one, such as generating advertising revenue. This is the case, for example, of social networks, such as uh, Facebook or search engines, such as Google, that offer, that offer free services to users. In exchange, they provide your data, or we provide our data. So there is no monetary transaction between Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, YouTube or Google, and, uh, and the users in terms of existing standards of trade. However, the data collected by these enterprises forms the basis of their revenues from advertisers. So while the advertising revenue uh, monetary flow is captured in trade, statis uh, trade statistics, 
the data flows upon which they depend on are not recorded. Now the third component or third dimension of the framework is the who or the participants in digital trade. So international trade is traditionally considered to take place between enterprises and to a let, uh, lesser extent between enterprises and governments. Uh, the technolo uh, technological change has however provided individual consumers and households with the possibility to purchase goods and services from foreign suppliers on a scale that was not possible before. So similarly, the possibility to sell online has lowered, and in many cases, the potential to lower um, from the barriers to export, allowing especially smaller firms to market their products ab uh, abroad. So this is the additional uh, benefit of engaging in digital trade. So those are the three dimensions of digital trade. Uh, which in involves the nature of the trade, or, the, or rather the nature of the transaction, or how, what, are, what the products being traded uh, are, so goods, services, and data, and then the participants in, di in digital trade. So any combination of these dimensions qualify as digital trade, as long as you have uh, more than one country involved. Our second objective was to look for available estimates of digital trade, uh, uh, specifically for the Philippines, using as a guide the working definition. So let's see if we were successful. <laughs> uh, these are the measurement challenges. So even with a workable conceptual fr framework, the task of me measuring digi digital trade faces many challenges. For one, technological innovations are creating new business models, uh, products and services that do not fit exactly within uh, traditional classification. So you can imagine, for example, Uber or Grab, which started out as a ride-hailing app. Even for that particular service, uh, it, uh, it can uh, be classified as well as transport, business services, or ICT services. And now it wants to be the app the everyday app, so it wants to deliver other types of services. Additionally, more liberal tariff regimes to encourage global e-commerce means that merchandise with a value below the de minimis uh, threshold enter freely and may not be recorded in official statistics uh, when they cross the border. So even if these were recorded in trade statistics, there is no way of determining whether the goods were purchased online or resulting from a digitally enabled transaction. So statisticians face a number of other problems. So one is that current trade data does not usually record how services are provided. There is Number two, there is no correlation between the volume of data and its value. And number three, identifying where exactly data are adding value since the data that crosses borders are mostly unpriced and tend to generate value only indirectly. Now in terms of the second um, component or second type of transaction, uh, we wanted to, oh sorry, this is still the first, uh, which refers to digitally ordered. And this is the typical e-commerce transaction. So first, in terms of global estimates, UNGTAD estimates that global e-commerce sales amounted to about 25 trillion in 2015, with almost 89% involving business-to-business -business transactions. Um, it was no noted, so again, we're interested more in the global, or rather the cross-border type. It was noted that despite growing interest in cross-border e-commerce, which is a, a component of the working definition of digital trade, there are virtually no official statistics on its value. And a few countries publish official estimates, uh, only a few countries uh, publish official estimates of this. Based on the limited information which they got, uh, UNCTAD estimates that cross-border B2C e-commerce in 2015 amounted to 189 billion or 6.5% of total B2C transactions, with some 380 million consumers making purchases on overseas websites. Now for the Philippines, the only official statistics that we have on e-commerce are from the uh, PSA, and, and in turn this is based on the annual survey of business and industry. 
So they um, regularly report on the sales from e-commerce transactions. And in 2016, which is the latest available information, they um, estimated about 41.3 billion uh, pesos uh, from e-commerce sales, which uh, surprisingly is a decrease of 7% compared to 2015 sales of 44 billion, even as the number of establishments were covered or that uh, the survey covered increased. And then uh, we, as you can also see, the transport and storage has the biggest share in e-commerce sales, which represent uh, online ticket sales. And then this is followed by accommodation and food service activities and arts, and then, enter and then arts, entertainment, and recreation. And then the other uh, sectors which are not reflected here means that either they did not have any e-commerce uh, sales or they just did not report them. So again, uh, we have this basic data or official data on e-commerce, but uh, in terms of cross-border e-commerce sales, which is the relevant metric for digital trade, uh, we, there doesn't, uh, doesn't exist right now in terms of official statistics. Now, in terms of the second type of transaction, which is uh, platform-enabled trade, uh, there are no estimates of platform uh, of this kind of transactions. And the best that we could find, which uh, because they are Google, must be authoritative, or at least they have a better handle compared to other industry reports. So the study by Google uh, estimates that the Philippines' internet economy is estimated at 7 billion, or about 2.1% of the country's GDP. Now, they also note that, uh, and these are the components of their estimates. So they have uh, e-commerce, the traditional e-commerce that we uh, know of, and then online travel, media, ride hailing, and they, for this year, they added digital financial services. Um, and they note that the Philippines is uh, still a relatively untapped opportunity and, and they see that the Philippines uh, as, the most, as the country with the most room for growth compared to other Southeast Asian um, economies. So apart from the lack of estimates of platform-enabled transactions, the additional challenge is in determining the share of cross-border. Again, the, the, the trade component is also missing. Uh, in terms of the third type of digital transactions, uh, we, it seems that at least we have some basis for this and, this, and the services trade statistics capture this third type of uh, digital trade transactions, um, which involves services and data flows that are digitally delivered. However, uh, it is not uh, precise and or not perfect because we, in trade statistics or services statistics, the mode of delivery is also not known. So whether the service was delivered digitally or in person. So that is a complication. Additionally, the data only captures trade with a monetary exchange. So many cross-border data transactions which have zero monetary value are not reflected, despite being valuable to business and consumers. So because the actual mode of delivery is not known, the more appropriate term is digitally deliverable rather than digitally delivered. So the digitally deliverable services series of ONGTAD is based on the concept of potentially ICT-enabled services. ITESs conceptually include activities that can be specified, performed, delivered, evaluated, and consumed electronically. Lacking an internationally agreed upon definition, it has been proposed that ITES be defined as services products delivered remotely over ICT networks, so over voice or data networks, including the internet. So again, although the various uh, uh, ICT-enabled services products could be delivered remotely, there is no information whether they were actually delivered uh, digitally, so hence the term digitally deliverable. Okay, so uh, this new cluster of services called digitally deliverable services is an aggregation of insurance and pension services 
financial services, charges for the use of intellectual property, telecommunications, computer and information services, other business services, and audiovisual and related services. So here uh, we can see that the share of digitally deliverable services in the total exports of the Philippines is uh, high compared to global and regional patterns. So from 2005 to 2018, uh, so 61% and 61.6% in 2018. So this is high compared to uh, global trends and comparator regions or regions where uh, the Philippines is considered part of. Uh, moreover, the Philippines enjoys a net surplus in this cluster of services. So you have uh, the exports uh, in blue and imports in uh, orange, uh, indicating a surplus. However, if, you, if we have a breakdown of this cluster, it shows that uh, the Philippine performance in digitally deliverable services is really driven only by two subsectors. So you have uh, the ones with the stars. You have computer services, which consists of hardware and software related services and data processing services. The other one uh, is technical trade related and other business services, which if you go to the BSP primer really refers to or reflects the call center activities. Now, clearly measurement of digital trade is a big issue, but given the nature of um, digital tra uh, transactions, it will take time, resources, and international cooperation to address data issues. So next I will discuss other challenges and identify opportunities for the Philippines, which is the third objective of our paper. So we have two sets of challenges and two sets of opportunities that we've identified. The first is uh, with respect to connectivity, which is broadly defined. In other words, it is not just being connected electronically, but also logistically, financially, and having the skills to harness digital trade. So the UNCTAD B2C e-commerce index reflects the processes involved in online shopping B2C transactions. So the index um, includes internet users, secure, serve, uh, se secure servers, account penetration, and postal reliability score. The ITU ICT Development Index is composed of three sub-indices, uh, access, use, and skills. And then the World Economic Forum's Network Readiness Index uh, is an aggregate of 53 indicators and, and four clusters, namely environment, read, the business environment, readiness, usage, and impact. So based on these measures, we can see that uh, if you were to divide the group in two, that the Philippines is in the bottom half in terms of e-commerce readiness. So uh, in terms of ICT connectivity, internet penetration is 60% of the population, while 69% enjoy mobile broadband services, but uh, the subscriptions uh, are not unique. So maybe that's why it's a, a high, uh, relatively high uh, figure. And then in, fix, in terms of fixed broadband subscriptions, it is very low at 3.2%. In terms of tariff rates, uh, the Philippine uh, monthly uh, tariff is above the median. And then in terms of uh, Philippine, uh, in terms of the financial connectivity, the Philippines also needs a, a lot of catching up. The Philippines is also underperforming in two out of three indicators of trade logistics. But uh, at least, well, in terms of the, fa uh, the last cluster, we are doing relatively well or better than world average in terms of skills uh, development. Oops. Okay. So the second set of challenges, uh, which are actually related to connectivity, the first set, and this has to do with policies and regulations. So the Philippine e-commerce roadmap listed 53 action agenda items spanning six uh, strategic areas, namely infrastructure, investment, innovation, intellectual capital, information flows, and integration. And uh, the six areas were patterned after the Apex Digital Prosperity Checklist. 
Based on DTI's midterm assessment, there are still a number of unfinished or incomplete actions. And so the DTI is currently drafting an updated roadmap, which will extend to uh, 2022. So I just wanted to give a flavor of the action items that have been accomplished against those that are still to be completed. But again, there are 53 uh, items, and maybe in the revised roadmap, they would be more uh, strategic in terms of identifying what uh, is really achievable by 2022. The other uh, constraint refers to or focuses on trade specifically and looks at the openness of the country to of, or a country to digital trade. So the European Center for International Political Economy developed the Digital Trade Restrictiveness Index, which maps and measures policy restrictions to digital trade in 65 countries including the Philippines. So it is the first of its kind, and it aims to increase transparency in how governments restrict digital trade. Um, it shows here that uh, China has the most restrictive policy environment for digital, digital trade, while New Zealand is the most open. And the Philippines is in the middle of the pack with an average uh, DTRI of uh, 0 0.24. So, the, the index is composed of uh, different uh, policy areas, such as um, fiscal restrictions and market access, establishment restrictions, restrictions on data and trading restrictions. And uh, not surprisingly, the Philippines ranks very low or very restrictive in foreign investment. So according to the authors, these restrictions are likely to cause a strong negative consequence or strong negative consequences on the extent to which countries can take advantage of new foreign technologies and benefit from spillover effects of FDI, including the adoption of foreign technologies by domestic companies. And in terms of the air policy area where the Philippines is least restrictive, it is in content access. So we are 64th out of 65 countries. These uh, types of, um, this particular policy area would include, for example, cases where the government blocks websites, filters web content, or delays or interrupts access to international websites. So if you look at it, there, it's possible that the two are actually related and we might have a distorted view of what we want to protect. Um, anyway, so now I've covered the uh, challenges. Now let's look at the opportunities. So with respect to opportunities, the services trade data reveal that we have comparative advantage in digital, de digitally deliverable services. So we must keep the momentum going in this sector. All the international organizations such as UNTA, WTO, and uh, the OECD are observing the rise of uh, intangibles in international trade. So we must take advantage of this. Note, however, that uh, based on the Revealed Comparative Advantage Index for digitally deliverable services, this index is going down, um, declining for the Philippines. So indeed, the growth of Philippine exports in digitally de deliverable services has been slowing, particularly when compared to its past uh, performance. So if you look at the top graph or yeah, table, you can com uh, see that uh, from growing at tw on average 21% from 2006 to 2010, uh, in the last three years, this sector has only grown by 2.29%, and then this is also lower compared to uh, the world and uh, the region. And then if we go by year also, we can see that um, the growth of digitally deliverable services exports have been very slow. So this should be a cause for concern. Since the cluster is mainly driven by the ITBPM sector, the government must work with the sector to ensure that this is just temporary and that, and that the ITBPM uh, industry can sustain its market, world market position. Hmm? 
Okay, the final opportunity um, is in terms of uh, digital products. The government, uh, uh, in, in addition to um, examining how it can help or boost the ITBPM sector, the government could also support new subsectors where we currently don't have a comparative advantage yet, but where we might have latent competitiveness, uh, specifically in some digital products. So given the country's pool of creative talent, attention should be given to the promotion of subsectors which rely on creativity. An export strategy could be developed promoting the creative industries such as copyright-based industries, specifically core CBIs, whose outputs can be digitally delivered over the internet. This would be in line with a development plan which seeks to promote creative industries that cover both tangible goods and ta intangible services. So, in fact, uh, a study by Francisco in 2014, they estimated that in the case of the Philippines, core CBIs uh, contributed 5.11% uh, of GDP and eight, almost 9% to total employment. So what are those core uh, CBIs? Uh, these are the nine uh, uh, industries considered as core copyright-based industries. So I, I guess we're all familiar with them, except for the last one. Uh, the copyright collective management societies are professional organizations that represent groups of copyright and related rights owners, such as authors, composers, publishers, writers, and photographers, musicians, and performers. So final, uh, final section in terms of areas of further study. Uh, clearly, measurement issues are very important for research and policy making. So the government will need better measures of e-commerce and cross-border uh, e-commerce in particular. Um, case in point is in the roadmap, it actually sets a target of 25% uh, contribution to GDP by 2020. But if we look at the results from the ASPBI and also even Google's estimates, it's quite far from these targets. So a more realistic uh, assessment or a more realistic measure it would be better. Um, so this is important. The measurement of cross-border transactions is very important, uh, not only for developing the sector, but also has implications for regulation, for trade policy, for fiscal policy, you know, taxes, uh, what else, competition issues, consumer protection. So the, it has actually, if we have a better handle of how the digital economy works, it actually affects a lot of policy areas. Another uh, important uh, issue uh, is with respect to promoting an inclusive digital economy. We should understand the drivers and impediments to wider adoption of e-commerce by enterprises and households. So um, this is, uh, in closing, this is a new area for, of policy research for the PIDS, and we are just at the start. In fact, uh, already, so this study was completed last year, and then my colleagues will present two other uh, studies on um, digital services. But already, we are working on six, uh, more than six studies related to the digital economy. So I guess um, the message is just watch this space for information. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comprehensive um, presentation, Dr. Serafica. Allow me to introduce our next speaker. She is a um, supervising research specialist here at PIDS. She finished her MA in Economics of International Trade and European Integration at the Staffordshire University and has written various studies on international relations and foreign policy. Friends, I give you Ms. Maureen Ann Rosellion. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be presenting this study, which uh, I, it's a study with uh, Dr. Gilbert Tolianto and Ms. Christina 
expertise um, in finance in the Philippines, status and prospects for digital financial inclusion. Um, so this is the outline of the presentation. Um, there will be an introduction. Uh, and then uh, next I will be uh, presenting uh, trends um, and then role of the regulator, a case study on e-finance in the Philippines. And then I will end with conclusion and uh, policy recommendations. So I guess first I'd like to uh, just give an overview about um, financial inclusion and digital finance. Um, Financial inclusion means bringing all segments of a population, irrespective of their economic situation, to have effective access to a wide range of financial products and services. And um, there have been global initiatives towards um, inclusive finance, as it has a great potential in con contributing to inclusive growth and in economic in income equality. Um, this statement is um, supported by um, empirical studies that observe that uh, development of inclusive financial systems can potentially improve welfare, reduce transaction costs, um, spur economic activity, and improve delivery of social benefits. Um, and the promotion of financial in inclusion has become a key objective, for instance, in Southeast Asia under the ASEAN Framework on Equitable Economic Development, and the Financial Inclusion Action Plan and Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion in the G20. Um, in the Philippines, the Philippine Development Plan also identified financial inclusion as a key objective for achieving the country's goal of inclusive growth. And then digital finance, on the other hand, is identified as a major instrument to uh, attaining financial inclusion. Um, it is identified as an immediate solution to address uh, pro uh, problems such as those related to uh, the building, the operations, maintenance, uh, and access costs to um, physical banking, um, especially for the hard to reach areas. And um, digital financial services can potentially provide the financially included, meaning the underserved and unserved, uh, as well as the M SMEs with access to relevant relevant, appropriately designed, and affordable financial services. And um, according to uh, CJAP, CGAP, di um, digital financial services are increasingly being made available to unbanked individuals through a variety of uh, digital channels, such as mobile phones, uh, point-of-sale terminals, networks of small-scale agents, um, payment aggregators. And then, um, based on the... Um, GSM, a global adoption survey, um, basic mobile payment services allow sending of money, payment of bills, or purchasing of prepaid electricity, for instance, with greater ease, um, affordability, and access. So uh, given that um, uh, background, and I mean, if... Maybe to give a quick, I'll be uh, presenting um, some statistics on uh, the Philippines, but for uh, maybe quick overview, um, we have, um, there's a uh, global microscope 2018 from the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, which uh, ranks countries in terms of uh, conducive environment to financial inclusion. And then we rank high, we're in the top five. And then, if, but if you look at the, um, there's a uh, financial inclusion survey by the BSP. Uh, there's uh, still many Filipinos that are unbanked. Um, there's 22.6% um, of uh, 68 million Filipino adults that uh, have formal financial account. So that's a bank account or a uh, microfinance, uh, cooperative, or an e-money account. And then only of this 26.5%, percent, percent, 11% have a bank account. And then um, also we're in a report in 2015 by the Cash Alliance, Better Than Cash Alliance, 
um, they find that we still are largely um, cash based. So a um, big part of our retail payments are still, we still use um, on cash basis. So um, given uh, that background, weak background, we, we conducted this study to examine the current landscape of e-finance or digital finance in the Philippines and um, analyze whether e-finance has enabled the last mile consumers to avail of financial products and services affordably and conveniently. And uh, in this paper, we look at uh, the user's perceived advantages, um, disadvantages, challenges, to um, using e-money or digital products, and also the regulator's role in propagating digital finance in the Philippines. Um, I should also add that this uh, paper is part of a um, uh, big project by um, Cuts International. So it's a uh, different, uh, it's a cross-country study. And then for the Philippines, it's a cross-country study on digital economy and uh, inclusive growth, I think. And um, for the Philippines, uh, one case study is this e-finance in the Philippines. Okay, so I'll be um, presenting some um, figures or statistics on um, the status of e-finance in the Philippines. So here we see um, the number of banks authorized by BSP to engage in banking operations. Um, in a, well the data is in an article, um, it was uh, observed that a big, a big chunk of uh, e-money transactions, around 78%, are, are reportedly done through banks. And then the rest are uh, accounted for by uh, other e-money issuers. Um, so here, um, from this from this table, you will see that uh, most of the banks offer the e-banking and e-money applications, um, particularly the universal and commercial banks. Then there are also rural banks that offer mobile banking. Um, internet banking, um, bank net cash out aggregator services, as well as um, e-money prepaid card, cash card, or remittance card. Um, maybe it's not well um, uh, something to support the 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 activities in the rural banks. Um, the Rural Bank Association of the Philippines um, released a report. And um, they said that many rural, rural banks are, uh, have been offering mobile money-enabled services. For example, um, Gcash, smart money-enabled ATM card services to their clients. And they have also been using SMS banking. And um, they also reported that um, in an article in 2014 that um, the rural banking industry has been has already processed more than 16 million in mobile transactions, uh, which involved 100 rural banks um, and their 1,200 branches and other banking offices. And then there are also non-banking entities uh, that use uh, financial technology to enhance the use of uh, financial services. So um, an example would be fintech. Um, which uh, develop products such as the um, lender or lender, um, uh, which uh, is a mobile, mobile technology platform in the applying and processing of uh, any type of loan. Um, so the subscribers of the mobile networks in the Philippines through their mobile device are able to make use of a non-stop application or portal showing multiple loan products of all partner banks and um, also microfinance institutions and companies. And it is uh, faster, more convenient, and it's a uh, dynamic and secure application process. And then the FinTech also offers microinsurance through its uh, Kasama Ka microinsurance program. Then we, <coughs> we look at um, electronic money in the Philippines. Um, in terms of transaction amount, so in 
um, from 2017 to 2018, there was a 13% increase in the amount of transaction inflows and outflows in uh, electronic money uh, the in 2018 amounting to 1.09 trillion pesos. And uh, you will see that we have, um, there's, uh, we observe an increase in um, the users of um, e-money wallets, active users of uh, e-money wallets, uh, prepaid cards, uh, and 18% uh, growth in credit cards. Okay, so um, we tried to look for um, for data that would look at the behavior of um, uh, users of e-money or potential users of e-money. So we were able to get uh, this uh, data from, oh, this is not, uh, uh, from the BSP Financial Inclusion Survey. And um, from the um, 209 respondents uh, that responded to this question, to the question in the survey, we see that um, the top reasons for not transacting with uh, e-money agencies uh, that the uh, products and services offered by the access points are not necessary or are not suited to personal requirements and preferences. And then the other top answer was um, lack of awareness in the conducting transactions. And then if we uh, look at um, our standing or how we fare with, uh, compared with our, um, our neighbors or with other countries in uh, the region, um, you see that um, on average, financial account holders in the Philippines mostly conduct uh, digital transactions when receiving payments. So, um, although we, I mean, compared to the other countries, we are um, low ranking, but um, uh, the figures here are uh, in percent of uh, uh, account holders. So we have, um, say for uh, receiving, made or received digital payments, we uh, increased uh, from 2014 to 2018, 19.5% to 25.1%. But relatively, we still have uh, a lower number of uh, uh, users of uh, digital payments or um, individuals who perform digital payments compared to our, uh, compared to our neighbors in the region. Oh, and you, you'll also see that those with uh, high capital, uh, high GDPs, high GDP economies are mostly those with uh, higher uh, indicators for digital payments. Okay, so now we look at the our role of the regulator, which is an important element to digital finance additional financial inclusion. So um, this list here is, I think um, the government through the BSP and the other um, government agencies are, have been uh, doing some initiatives uh, on this. Um, for instance, in uh, the BSP has been uh, very supportive of initiatives in terms of uh, access and use of digital financial service. So we have the for example, we have the National Retail Payment System, which is, uh, serves as the backbone of digital finance in the Philippines. And then, um, as for um, consumer protection, because um, we were able to interview um, someone from the BSP, they said that even without, the, without um, financial inclusion or the digital finance um, initiatives, there's uh, always been a consumer protection um, being uh, done um, and it is a priority of the government for me, uh, may it be um, um, digital or non-digital financial transactions. 
And then um, it's also important to maintain regulatory tools and capabilities while anticipating future demands of the market. Um, and then, um, also to uh, ensure connectivity, for instance, faster, affordable, and secure internet connection, because this is, um, I mean, it's, it's a big part of the of uh, digital finance without um, a fast, uh, faster, affordable, and reliable inter internet connection, then you won't be able to access or transact uh, with uh, financial institutions. And then um, there's also a need to increase digital awareness among um, the providers and end users, such as in terms of safety. Um, trust issue among consumers is a problem. It's a con it's, it is a big concern. And in this regard, digital literacy and protection would be very important. Um, if you would recall, there was um, one of the reasons for not using or part not using e-money is the uh, lack of information on how to do the transactions. Then, of course, uh, there's uh, it is important also to encourage development of, of accessible, affordable, and comprehensible products. Uh, we have um, we have uh, now um, we can have a mic micro deposits, and then also I think there's uh, I forgot the term, but there's you can uh, there's a, a bank account wherein you can have zero balance. I think that's very helpful for. Uh, especially for the low-income uh, clients. And then there's also micro-insurance, which is, I think, uh, highly supported by the DOF. Okay, so um, for this study, we, we chose um, uh, a case for uh, just to... to um, to, uh, to probe into the experience of and concerns of digital users, digital finance users. So we chose the um, Connect to Card, my mobile app. Um, this is a um, mobile banking application introduced by Card Bank Incorporated. So it's um, the serve, so you, you can um, download it on your uh, Android mobile phone. And um, I think it's, you can get it from Google Play. And then you can um, create your account using your account in the, at Card Bank. So the services available in this uh, mobile app is include um, cash in or deposits or savings, cash out, withdrawals or loans, cash payment, balance in query, transaction history, fund transfer within the bank, within accounts in, in the bank and then customer service. So this is, uh, the service from Card Bank is uh, still not like completely digital because you have um, agents that um, I'd say, parang they act like mobile ATM <laughs> machines. So if you would like to um, say cash out, you want to withdraw, then the, the agent will be giving you the cash, so the, the withdrawal amount. Or if you want to deposit, then the same thing. So you give money to deposit through the agent. But um, the balance inquiry, fund transfer, you can uh, do using the application, the mobile app. So card, just maybe a uh, quick um, description about card bank. Um, it is a... Um, Microfinance-oriented bank, rural bank, and uh, it aims to provide financial and non-financial services to the poor, especially among women and uh, families in the countryside. Um, and then, majority of its clients are female, uh, married, or and are uh, over 30 years old. Um, and the loans are mostly um, under microfinance, housing, agriculture, uh, agriculture loans. And then um, the Card Bank Inc. has been awarded the Financial Inclusion Champion by BSP. 
And then they've had, um, they started some innovations in the bank through the, what they call mobile financial services um, in 2011. But this one is SMS enabled, so you get um, SMS messages about the balance of your account, etc. And then after that, because they had some problems if in that um, uh, program or, or service. So in 2017, that's when they um, came up with the Connecto Card um, mobile app. So to um, um, probe on the, the um, experience, concerns of uh, the, the users of um, um, connect, uh, K2C, connect the card, K2C, we conducted um, FGD, and then uh, it was uh, done to determine the responsiveness of members, so that means the clients and the agents, in using digital finances, financial services, particularly the, the K2C, and their usage behavior, challenges, and issues. Um, participants of this FGD were uh, uh, registered users of the K2C. And then, uh, so majority, just to give a uh, description of the, the participants, majority are at least, high, at least high school graduates, are married, and uh, self-employed. And some of the employment um, are employed are um, sari sari store owners, direct sellers, or buy and sellers. Um, they have computer rentals or uh, piggery. Um, um, they do e load or e money. And they also receive money from remittances from family and relatives. And then um, this uh, participants in, the, in our FGD have been clients of the uh, bank for five years or more. And then the reasons for uh, opening a bank account are uh, for savings, loans, and for loans for their business and for the tuition of their children. Okay, so I'll go straight to the findings from the FGD. Um, so uh, they said, uh, the participants said the when they used the K2C app, uh, they found that uh, the transaction process is uh, easier, faster, it's uh, convenient. So cause, uh, you can, if you want to know the balance of your account, you can just go and open your application, your app. And then, so you can check it any time of the day. So that's what they like about it. And then they also, they, oh yeah, they can withdraw, they can deposit, they can get a loan uh, from using the mobile app and through the agents of the bank. So they don't need to, because um, the agents go to the, the communities. So that means they don't have to go to the urban center or to the town, to the bank. And so it's less costly. So there's uh, less or no transportation cost. And then it, stay, it saves time in a saves time in a sense that they well they it takes time to go to the bank, and then you have to also well if you're quite unlucky you have to wait for a few hours to uh, get your transaction done. And then um, as far as bottlenecks. Uh, there's still um, a part of the, I guess, the population that's um, still apprehensive or hesitant uh, with um, using new technologies. Um, and in this um, FGD, we found that these are mostly the uh, older, older members or th those that are less uh, tech savvy. And then presence of an alternative option is this, well, we mean the, the traditional, so physical banking. They still prefer to go to the bank. Um, and then, well, related to that is because there's um, transaction charge with the agent 
So when you withdraw or get the loan or deposit, there's a charge for every. There's um, um, certain amounts and then that corresponds to certain charges as well. And they find that it's more costly. So some of the members find it costly. And then absence of required device, so some of the members uh, don't have um, smartphones because you need the smartphone phone to, to use the application. And then there's a weak intermittent mobile phone signal because there's uh, the, these areas where the, the members are, are usually remote, so um, rural, rural areas or remote areas and so they, uh, there's um, sometimes weak internet signal and, um, and so they won't be able to um, access the, mo the, the mobile app when they need to. Okay, so um, some insights on, on this um, um, FGD that we did uh, for um, with uh, card banks key to see. So um, previous studies suggest that um, so I, there is uh, digital finance benefits households and individuals if you talk of convenience or time saving less costly bank transactions. And um, previous studies suggest that um, in owning an account, especially by women in the household, uh, there's a tendency to spend on food education and healthcare, thereby increasing the welfare of and productivity of the family. And um, in a study in Nigeria, it was found that the amount of times and money saved has helped improve people's management of their time as well as their expenses. So they're able to spend more time at work and income generating activities. And then uh, there's also a study in Malawi, which uh, found that Farmer, farmers whose crop sales income are deposited into their accounts were able to spend 30% more on inputs for future crops and reached 21% average increase from the previous year's harvest compared to farmers who received payments in cash. Um, these studies indicate that um, through digital finance, people could improve management of their income and expenses and are able to um, invest more probably in their business, businesses or occupations and spend more on food, education, and healthcare, and even put money aside for unanticipated economic shocks. And then with, um, with having experience for these uh, members or registered members to the K2C, um, while the um, mobile application offers basic services, uh, basic financial services, um, with the experience, they've, experience and knowledge that they have had in terms of dig digital finance, um, the, the members have now asked for other facilities. So they sort of demand more digital service. So, for example, they want, um, they would like to have, um, uh, they would like to be able to transfer funds to another bank, because for, because for now they can only transfer within, within the bank, uh, accounts within the bank. And then they wish they could also do bill payments and other fin uh, financial services. And then there's uh, issues and concerns of members as to the use of uh, K2C. And these are related to uh, access cost, connectivity, and hesitation to use technology. Um, some of the members find the mobile access uh, charge or transaction charge uh, relatively high, especially when compared with options to transact in group through the agents or uh, to just go directly to the bank. Ex um, this is uh, especially or particularly for those who live within or are in uh, close proximity to the, to the bank or the center. And then there's some um, hesitation in using the app, especially, like I said, the older 
um, I think they they call it ano ba? grade divide. I learned that last week. <laughs> grade divide, so the older. <laughs> Uh, and then the less tech-savvy members. And then, uh, so in, in both, uh, on these cases, uh, continuous and financial education could lessen the concerns. Um, but on the weak internet connectivity concern, I think that's something that the government and the private sector can improve on. So here we... Um, Presents, uh, present some of the conclusion and recommendations uh, to improve provision and use of digital financial products and services. So first is financial education or financial literacy and review of the complexity of digital platforms. Um, as I said earlier, there's um, some hesitation to use the mobile app K2C for uh, by some of the, by the older or the less uh, tech-savvy segment of the uh, members of the bank, of members of the bank. Um, it's, I think it's, it's very important because there's, there's one case where, um, uh, this is an agent um, um, talking about her experience with her group, with her center. So at first, they were the members were very hesitant about it, about uh, downloading the app and using it. But then after, um, after convincing them, giving them information on the advantages of using the mobile app, then uh, this agent was able to register all the members in her center. Um, and then improve digital infrastructure. So um, usage of e-finance depends largely on digital infrastructure. So um, I think we uh, there's uh, room to improve on the speed of internet in the Philippines. Um, I think the speed is uh, one of the lower speeds in ASEAN. Or in the region, it is and it is lower than the global global average. And then um, continue to find ways to extend affordable, um, su suitable and convenient financial services to Filipinos, especially those in hard to reach areas. Um, so yes, the the private sector has been active and innovative uh, in improving the financial landscape. So, for example, the this um, financial product offered by card bank and then also the products being offered by fintech and then i think the the government uh, through the bsp ha um, has been very supportive of uh, this innovations from the private sector um, and then invest in innovative methods of identification um, so i think there, there's a national id now being piloted. So, well, this was written in 20, 20, last year or 2017. So, um, so there, um, I think uh, we, we find that it's, uh, it is needed for, especially for uh, facilitating potential users who may not have um, or have difficulty secu securing ID cards to participate in the financial system. And then um, uh, for future concerns, interoperability could be a source of concern as it may affect the costs of uh, service provision. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, very informative presentation, Mao. We are down to our uh, last speaker this afternoon. He is a senior research fellow here at PEDS. He has worked on a number of research topics, including agriculture, agriculture, trade, and rural development. He obtained his PhD in development economics from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Dr. Francis Kimba. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Magandang hapon po. And now I'm going to present the case um, of the um, e-education in the Philippines, specifically looking at the case of the Test the Online program. Let me go through my presentation this way. Um, the, I will provide the background of the project where this case was actually a part of, and then provide the profile, and then the key findings and recommendations. Sorry. So PIDS, together with CUTS, Consumer Unity and Trust Society International, and CERC, CUTS International Institute for Regulation and Competition, developed this report to describe the state of the digital economy of the country. The report also touches on the benefits and risks of the risks the digital economy has brought to its citizens. Also, the report identified ways to clear the bottlenecks and so as to strengthen the, the digital economy and improve the consumer welfare. To achieve this, this country report explored the case of digital finance, which you heard earlier, uh, as explained by Mao, and e-education, which I will talk about. Digitalization has expanded the reach and access to basic services. And this paper wishes to show that digitalization has the potential to reach the last mile consumers which we define as, follow, as follows. The last mile consumers are understood to be individuals or households that are willing yet unable to pursue their human aspirations following a mixture of financial, geographic, or cultural obstacles. So this would include, for, for instance, the poor, uh, for those um, living below uh, $2 or $1.90 per day, or housewives, especially those in highly patriarchal societies who have, no, uh, who have limited ability to pursue further education. Also, overseas Filipino workers, for instance, those Filipino workers distanced from their families for years, and households in far-flung areas or away from towns or city centers. So the hypothesis is that the digital economy would allow uh, these uh, last mile consumers to have access to different kinds of services. So there is a need to expand access to quality technical vocational education to reach out to more people, particularly in the remote areas. However, building more technical vocational institutes is costly in terms of resources and time. But with the advent of the ICT applications, TV, um, technical and vocational institutes can expand through e-learning. So in 2012, the TESDA online program was launched by TESDA and became the first Filipino institution offering mass, massive open online courses. This is in response to the large demand for technical and vocational skills training, as can be seen in 2016, where there, is a, there are about 2.27 million TVET enrollees. The TESDA online program is also in line with the National Technical Education and Skills Development Plan of 2011 to 2016, which states that ICT must be integrated in vocational education. Also, um, the TESDA online program takes advantage of the growing percentage of Filipinos with internet connections, which is around 63.58% uh, in 2016. I'm sure it's much higher now. And the increasing trend of digitization of learning. So what makes it different? The traditional face-to-face -face learning model of TESDA is modified, as um, you can see on the, the top uh, figure. Yeah, that's the face-to-face. -face. 
is modified to an online program hybrid model, which is here in the bottom part, where the, where the idea is one can access the, the free online Tibet education, practice the skill, and become certified, and then get a job. So the process is really, simply put, free online Tibet education and then practice the skills anywhere or at home and then be a certified worker and eventually get the job. The goal is really to learn at your own pace, in your own time, and at your own place. And one can actually keep on learning the lessons over and over again to gain mastery. And what can you learn? Apparently a lot. So as of uh, February 2018, eTESDA offers 59 online courses across uh, different sectors from agriculture, electronics, and entrepreneurship to maritime, tourism, and ICT learning. So ICT would include basic computer operation and food and beverage servicing, like being a busboy, room attendant, servicing, waiter servicing, and housekeeping, guest room attendant servicing, and valet servicing. And these 59 courses have grown because only in 2012, there's been only about six online courses being offered by TESDA. The courses are developed by f based on five print guiding principles. So innovation in the topics delivered, there should be an alignment to the materials of existing standards of TESDA. Learning, it should be learning-centered, bearing in mind that um, learners are, have different style types. And then it should be easily understood and self-paced. TESDA has partnered with subject matter experts and private organizations such as Microsoft Online, Udacity, um, Consuelo Foundation, Coca-Cola Philippines, and others, in order to come up with um, a number of courses available. Who has had access? There are about 1.1 million registered users to the top users online, with 71% enrolled in at least one top course. I think I'm one of the 1.1 million registered top users. <laughs> But I haven't enrolled, so I'm not part of the 71%. So females comprise 60% of the top users, with 23.8% of sessions occurring abroad. As of May 2017, 46.8% of enrollees have already completed their course. Most enrollees take up courses either in ICT, 51%, or tourism, 20.7%. Courses with the highest percentage of completers are, as a proportion of enrollees, are heating, ventilating, air conditioning, and refrigeration, 77.2%, ICT, 65.5%, and TVET, 59.9%. The majority of top users are college graduates, 65%, and are 25 to 34 years old, 43.6%. Most users are located in Balance Luzon, so that's Luzon minus NCR, and NCR, so mainly the Luzon Island. So we, ha we actually have this question about who, who gains access, or wh where are they coming from? But there's no question in the Test the Online program asking the, the enrollees or the registered users where are you from, or where's your address, or where's your specific address? But at least there was a question on what's your province. So what we did is we overlaid the location of the users by province to the uh, HDI index of the different provinces to see whether the online, test the online program is reaching a wider uh, area of the Philippines. So I think well, in fairness to the online program, there are dots in almost all provinces, except, I guess, for some islands. But there is actually a very, very small, 2.69% um, are in the third, fourth, fifth class municipalities in low HDI provinces in the Philippines. 
these categories, these municipalities are categorized with having the lowest average annual incomes. And, well, at least to me, this, although it's very weak correlation, it shows that at least there are some areas in the country that are being reached even if they have um, low-income provinces. And an evidence of reaching at least these provinces where you can consider the people living there as last-mile consumers. And then we actually, we are wondering, um, we tried to reach out to a number of, or we conducted a perception survey uh, on the test the online program. So we inserted a questionnaire on the um, test the online program. So when you fill it up, when you register, before you can proceed with what you want to do, you have to answer our questionnaire. And the questionnaire gathered characteristics of the registered users and then profiles and, um, and profiling their experiences and the relevance of the program to them. The questionnaire was uploaded to the, in the, to the portal for two weeks from January 26, 2018 to February 6, 2018. And what did we learn from those responses? First, of the 218 respondents who are enrollees of any one of the top courses, test the online program courses, 56% enrolled in eTESDA for skills upgrading or enhancement, while 41 or 19% enrolled for employment. Majority of the enrollees identified convenience, 78%, learning at your own pace, 71%, and unlimited access to materials, 57%, as the main benefits of enrolling at eTESDA. Only 49% found eTESDA affordable, despite access to it is for free. And we attribute this mainly to the cost of internet connection to access the TESDA online program. What are the challenges? So about 35 enrollees or 49% identified internet issues as one of the main challenges faced in terms of accessibility. Issues on internet include slow internet speed, expensive or costly data usage, unstable data connection, and sometimes no internet access. Other identified challenges are the lack of instruction of completing the course, specifically on assessment and certification procedures, 7%, and some others have issues on registration, such as forgetting their username and password, and finding some of the forms tedious to fill out. Enrollees have given a very high and high satisfaction rating to the eTESDA program in terms of navigating the eTESDA portal website, around 85%. Registration and enrollment, also 85%. Instruction and courses offered, 83%. Format, course content for the materials, and relevance to the course actual needs. So essentially, there's um, an overall ex positive overall experience in accessing test the online program, except for some of the challenges. But we also have some findings based on an FGD that we conducted. First, homes, homes may not have the required infrastructure to support the practice of the skills they have learned online. So if it's a basic um, cookery or um, basic um, cleaning the bed, or fixing the bed. I, I mean that you can do and practice that at home, but if it's um, air conditioning, I don't think you would want to tinker with your own refrigerator or with your own air conditioning in order to practice what you have learned. So the proportion of um, completers in air conditioning and ventilating, ICT and Tibet are high, maybe because it is a job requirement or the skills the enrollees have learned could be used in their jobs. And this is very common to what uh, very commonly heard um, among the respondents in our FGD. So it's, um, they really try to complete the course mainly because it's driven by the, the push of their employers. They, they really wanted to learn more, uh, more skills in order to improve in their work. Because of lack of data, no study has been undertaken to identify what are the determinants of course choice for TOP for top registrants. And I think this is the next step for uh, whatever study that uh, TESDA online program would want to pursue. 
it's really to identify what are the needs of their clients. TOP has the potential for reducing the training cost through the use of a blended program where students combine face-to-face -face instruction with online learning. So you don't really need to practice everything at home. So what you can do or what TESDA can really do is they can uh, push students to start learning at home by watching the videos and then when proceed to the test t TVI, vocational, in vocational Institute, and then that's where they can practice and do, do the the tinkering of whatever they need to tinker. Last, uh, one possible explanation for the high passing rate is the opportunity to learn at your own pace and revisit some of the learning materials and videos for some courses. By focusing on learning at one's pace, the students can spend more time learning the topics in which they need more instruction rather than spending time on topics they are already familiar with. When we conducted this study, I think the test, the online program, was still a, an ad hoc um, team in TESDA. So one, really one of the recommendations was to push for a more institutionalized division of the TESDA online program in TESDA, seeing that this is really going to be part of what is going to be their function in the future. So the increasing demand for online courses and availing of the online assessments indicate the high interest in the TESDA online program. Being the first Philippine massive open online courseware, the program should go to the next level through the institutionalization of an e-TESDA division with plantilla position for recommendation to the DBM. The e-TESDA PMU, Project Management Unit, have already submitted its proposal to become a permanent division backup by concrete justification. Staff recruitment and development, management and leadership are important in securing the quality and sustainable TESDA online program. The e-TESDA must establish strong collaboration with private organizations, employers, and key stakeholders, labor market and industry, and the government itself by encouraging them to take part in skills development through ICT. Partnerships and linkages are more effective approaches to skills development. There is a need to intensify the promotion of the TESDA online program through advocacy activities and information campaigns. This may include the development of information, education, and communication materials to generate increased awareness on the program, promotional face-to-face -face campaigns to reach the targeted disadvantaged groups in rural areas, can be programmed in coordination with schools, local government units, and private institutions. As the TESDA online program continu continuously develops relevant and practical course offerings, there is a need to ensure that all online curricula and program content meet or exceed the, the occupational and training standards of quality. Creating more courses means that more opportunities for learners to become more productive. There is also a need to continuously review and update existing online courses and test for its effectiveness, making it continuously relevant to industry needs. Test the online program courses should be designed to meet the changing job requirements and the labor market needs to produce globally competent Filipino workforce with the acquired 21st century skills. So those are our um, proposals to improve the e-testa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Kimba. Now we are ready for the open forum. May I request our presenters to, to occupy the seats in front? Before we uh, begin with the Q&A, may I request our participants, if you want to ask questions, or before asking the questions, can you please state your name and your affiliations first? Who would like to to ask the first question? Yes, Doctor uh, Mr. Agustin. Thank you. For, <clears throat> thank you for the excellent presentations. And uh, I'm Dan Agustin. 
Steam Agricultural Sector Land Bank in the Philippines. I used to be with the uh, National Land Power Youth Council. Today it's known as TESDA. And I agree with the recommendations of uh, Dr. Francis. Because during our time the, uh, under the National Land Power and Youth Council, um, we you we used to be to coordinate with uh, the private sector. Actually, it's the private sector that would send the trainees to the training program. And this was incorporated. Uh, I don't know if you recall your economic history. We invited the dean of Yale University then to develop our economic plans. But that is a good recommendation. And I think. Uh, TESDA is also in the right direction because TESDA now, before we were under the office of the president, today we are now under, uh, TESDA is now under the Department of Trade and Industry. And I think that is a uh, uh, good direction. And, and I being in the agriculture. Um, um, and this related to financial inclusion of the Mam Ana. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we have uh, the Agri Agra law, and uh, there's only one bank that is uh, comply complying with the Agri Agra law. Probably the FinTech now would be a welcome uh, development. Uh, what I'm wondering is. How do they extend loan? Is it uh, because when you extend loan, you try to see your clients to be bankable, right? Is it cash basis or cash, uh, what they call this, cash flow analysis, which is the present system, or the value chain uh, system? How, how does connect extend loans? Because our universal banks do not extend loans especially to the agricultural sector. They would rather pay fines. Uh, how does, for example, connect, extend loan? And what is their collection rate? Uh, and mind you also, uh, there are fintechs today uh, being warned by the Banco Central and uh, the sect because they're extending loans without registration. And uh, to Madame uh, Serafica, uh, World Bank uh, on Trade uh, finds that compared to our Asian neighbors, one of the challenges that our trade costs, uh, we, we tap, the Philippines is tap in terms of trade costs compared to our neighboring countries. Now, under the uh, PDP, I wonder if digitalization would reduce uh, trade costs and uh, would assist in the east of doing business, especially so we're attracting foreign investments. And also in related to agriculture, because this is a program of Secretary Dar to promote agricultural products as exports. Because Dr. Dar used to be with the Bureau of Agricultural Research. And if you go to the Bureau of Agricultural Research, we have so many agricultural products, but sad to say, nasa estante lang yung mga produkto eh. I wonder if the these agricultural products, because you recommended the exports, would uh, this technology now could promote agricultural products? Because according to Secretary uh, Lopez, uh, we are still, uh, what they call this, net importers. Thank you very much. And uh, rural inclusion. Uh, our target uh, under ICT, I think, is 5,000 towers. Uh, we do, and uh, SMART, uh, I attended a hearing in Congress, SMART and GLOBE are not willing to put up 
towers. How can there, there be uh, financial inclusion without towers? Who will put up uh, city government? And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christine. Let's start with um, Dr. Serafika to be followed by uh, Ms. Mao and then Dr. Kimba. So thank you for your question, sir. I think uh, precisely the promise of the technology or digital technologies is supposed to bring down the cost of doing business, of uh, make uh, supply chains more efficient, and reduce trade costs uh, more generally. Uh, as to your question uh, in terms of whether this is reflected in the uh, Philippine Development Plan, I think when it was first formulated three years ago, it wasn't that explicit. But hopefully, I think in the updating of the plan, which is now being undertaken, um, I, I believe the ICT has a more uh, specific uh, strategies with, with respect to uh, digitalization. And they have the Digital Philippines program. So, uh, so in that sense, I think the government plans and initiatives, uh, especially now, uh, as compared to a few years ago, uh, I think the government is now better um, prepared and more um, welcoming of the of how these technologies can be uh, used to uh, implement their programs. Thank you, Dr. Serafika. Mao. Um, regarding the um, agricultural loans, well, unfortunately, I don't have data on information on the collection rate, but um, based on the loan distribution in the card bank, I'm referring to card bank, there's only 5% uh, on the agricultural loan. Um, it's well, it's a microfinance bank, so I guess it's uh, small loans for farmers or those who are um, engaged in agricultural activities. So for those um, that need, I guess, bigger amount of loans, they go to um, uh, the more commercial or maybe drift banks that they could offer them uh, those loans. Um, and then... On the on your comment on the connectivity, <laughs> well, I'm not sure what what to say, but because um, 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 there must be some kind of some sort of um, I don't know incentive or um, uh, cooperation between uh, the private sector and then the local government on. Um, some maybe some kind of partnership that they can do to um, to get the um, people in the rural areas or those uh, far from the ur urban centers to be connected to get you know um, stronger signals or um, internet connection. Thank you, Mao, Dr. Kimba. Uh, thank you very much for the comment. We, I appreciate. Um, the agreement to the recommendations and the, uh, the value of uh, uh, connecting more with the private sector in order to improve the quality of the uh, programs and courses in the test the online program. Uh, regarding the comment on um, improving connectivity, uh, I think uh, it is important to uh, identify what uh, what is the quality, what type of good is uh, connectivity or, for instance, uh, access to Wi-Fi? Um, I think um, the provision of the access to Wi-Fi is uh, the foundation of a lot of all these, um, uh, all these applications. And um, if, if it is a public good where um, the, the scope is really a uh, beyond the, the limit or there could be a lot of uh, free riders i think then that there is a uh, scope for the government to provide that service but on the other hand it's really not a, a completely uh, public good because um, there will always be people who will be excluded 
when it's not completely excludable. So uh, I think there's really a uh, room to understand and um, study the issue whether of access to Wi-Fi is a public good that the government should uh, provide. Thank you, Dr. Kimba, for other questions, please. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Manny Bjorna from De La Salle University Logistics Institute. Uh, we're developing right now as, we're developing right now an e-commerce e platform for the agricultural se sector in partnership with a company. And um, most of the systems that we have right now are made, are made used by industrial by the industrial sector or the service sector. Uh, why do you think uh, this is the case? Uh, is there a special barrier when you talk about agri sector? being incorporated in in e-commerce platforms. So that's the first question for Dr. Sirafika. For uh, my second question is for Dr. Kimba. Yeah, uh, I'm a bit familiar with, um, with the e-commerce, uh, with, with, with the online system before, because we were the one who started it um, with, with Consuelo Foundation. And the original concept really is to, to develop that, because during, during some time, 2005 to 2010, there was a... Uh, we were lacking uh, technical trainers. So the idea is uh, the students can go at their own pace, go through the modules uh, without the instructor, but they do hands-on training uh, with, 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 the, with the instructor. So uh, I just don't know if, because um, uh, TVET training is mostly hands-on. So how is this being addressed right now with the online, with the online training program? Because originally it was not designed it was not supposed to be designed that way. Um, and uh, in line with that also, were, were there data comparing the, uh, the passing rate of, uh, of certification programs of students that went through the online training program and those who gone through it using the normal, the normal uh, process? Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Let's start with Dr. Kimba. Um, okay, let me answer the question in the reverse order. Yes, there's actually uh, some data. I'm actually trying to look for it in the study. But um, it shows that there's a com relatively comparable passing rate between the, those who um, uh, pursued the program using the test the online program as against those who um, participated in the face-to-face -face program. And, and I guess one of the reasons, I, well, to me, I think it's really because they can keep on repeating. You can pause if you didn't understand what was uh, mentioned and then keep on repeating until you understand what the, what the um, video was uh, trying to convey. Um, but I guess there's uh, the, the caveat that um, up to a certain point, you can, if you don't really understand, you really won't understand something even if you keep on repeating it. Because um, one of the results of the FGD says that they would appreciate having the time to chat or consult with someone in case they have questions. Because really, in the end, um, you can keep on repeating the video, but I, for further questions and un further understanding, you really need someone to guide you. And I guess that's also where the first question is coming in, right? Because um, how do you um, make sure that the train or uh, how was how is the program used? Um, actually, the test the online program is not completely a, a digital program where there's already no more interaction between the teacher and the students. What happens is that um, you look at the you try to get some. Uh, early information or additional information by attending the test the online program or by going through the online test the online program and then you can actually also go to test that to the TVIs if it's close to you so that you can actually start practicing there so it's it's some sort of a blended program where you can actually gain some um, experience in doing the hands-on in the TVIs but of course, if, there, if it's something simple like um, cooking, which you can do in your own kitchen, you have the option, of course, to do it in your, in your own home. But it's really the, the idea is learn at your own pace and then you practice it 
at your own place or where it is convenient to you. So I guess that's really the the way um, test the online program or the, the test the online program is uh, helping out the entire Tibet uh, system. Thank you, Dr. Kimba. Dr. Serafika, please. Sorry, I'm trying to understand the problem. So, because uh, last week we uh, attended like two intensive days of of, of uh, discussions on digital platforms. So there are many kinds of platforms. You have transaction-based platforms where you have the, the platform acts as an intermediary between the, say, the sellers and the buyers. And then you have the technology-based platform where you build other platforms. So in your case, uh, what type of platform are you promote, so are using? Okay. 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 Uh, again, from what I know, to, to grow a network uh, a platform, a transaction-based platform, because these are really based on uh, what they call indirect network effects. So as a buyer, I don't really care how many buyers there are. I care about the sellers, the, the other side of the platform. And then as a seller also, you're concerned about the number of buyers on the other side of the platform. And that's why it's a really a winner-take-all type of industry. So it's for whoever owns the platform, the, what they do, and I, I think right now, and they say platforms are not, um, are still at this stage where they're trying to grow the network. We don't really know if they're earning much. So in, in, what I'm saying is that's the kind of investment that you need to undertake if you want to grow a uh, digital platform such as uh, what you're, I think what you're trying to sell in terms of um, acting as a middleman between the agricultural producers and the uh, consumers. Having said that, I think because agriculture is, um, has a special place in the development uh, agenda, perhaps this is an area where the government can actually uh, help you in terms of growing the business. So government as a buyer or as a facilitator can be a, an avenue. So it's not a purely commercially driven enterprise. Uh, again, because of the nature of the business that you're into. Thank you, Dr. Serafika. Other questions from uh, our par participants, please? I comment, Dr. Kimba. I think it's also because uh, the, the, the nature of the products, of agriculture products, is it's very difficult to transport in, 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 the, in our very uh, logistically impeded uh, country. Because, um, for instance, milk uh, milk products are very very prone to spoilage so it's it really the trans the for you to transport them it's only going to be in your natural geographic circle so the, i think that's one uh, limitation in in terms for agri products unlike for for example manufactured goods where you know you, you can just uh, easily transport them without uh, f the fear of spoilage or other Thank you so much, Dr. Kimba. I would also like to add <laughs> okay. that um, I think especially for, for ag or any kind of business, in uh, ecosystem is very important. So he mentioned logistics and agriculture would have its own special needs in terms of supply chain requirements. So you cannot just build your platform and then expect or you know everything to follow it. You really have to also make uh, investments in, in building the ecosystem for your for your business. Any other comments from our presenters before I we accept the the other questions from the participants? Okay, questions, please. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Mai Sawali from CPBRD, and thank you for sharing the results of your studies. I'm just curious about, for Ms. Rosalon, I'm just curious about the K2 card application. If there is an option to use the Philippine or any local dialect in access in using the application, um, or was it ever raised as an issue in your FGD as one of the uh, reasons for the hesitancy of the use? Because in one of the seminars that I attended, the, the availability of a local dialect as an option to access the application was among the identified success factors in the use of an application. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that, ma'am. Um, Ms. Mao? Is local dialect uh, a factor? It, I think that's um, an I think infor, important factor. It's influential to using a mobile app. But I think uh, as far as I know, the application is um, there's no local um, um, dialect or language uh, used. Um, well, when, when we went to when we did the FGDs, it was uh, being piloted in um, in um, Laguna. I think there's another one, but it's uh, in the Tagalog region. And then there, well, we weren't able to ask that question, but they, um, um, I think the the. Um, the executives of the bank were looking at uh, improving the these uh, current i mean the list of services that they're offering and they would like to improve the um, um, uh, offering of those services because sometimes there's uh, problems with connecting to the app so they're more concerned about those at the the beginning of the the uh, implementation of the uh, mobile application. Thank you, Ms. Mao. Question, please. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Grace Santos from the Internet Society and the Better Broadband Alliance. Um, I'd like to address my question to Ms. Uh, Maureen Rosalion. Um, you mentioned that I think it was you or Dr. Serafica who mentioned that 26% um, of the population, um, is that's the percentage of those uh, engaged in formal financial accounts or that, that, that have uh, the, such accounts and only 11 point something percent have a bank account. Okay. So I can't quite reconcile why despite having 124% uh, mobile phone subscription, 60 to 70 percent smartphone penetration and having a population that's widely known for being technology savvy, social media savvy. And um, we have, uh, I think, our population spends the most time online despite having poor and expensive internet connectivity. Um, I can't quite um, reconcile why there is still very poor uptake in terms of mobile banking. Um, Studies have shown that mobile banking is supposed to be the solution to financial inclusion. And if you go around the country, even in places where there is no 3G, 4G connectivity, people do have smartphones because these devices, um, you can easily buy them at 1,200 pesos and it's already um, internet uh, ready. So where do you think the gap is? Is it a trust issue? Is it an infrastructure issue? Or do you think Filipinos in general um, are not ready for the, a digital revolution? Actually, any of the speakers can respond. Thank you. Let's start with Ms. Mao. Thank you for that question. Um, I think you're right. It's, um, issue, it's an issue on trust and security as well on um, because it in, it, it involves money, it involves, um, um, well, you're not sure if uh, you, your transaction will be successful. And then, because sometimes you hear, especially, well, you hear um, news about um, um, your um, bank account getting uh, withdrawn money from your bank account and you don't know what happened, you didn't, uh, you did not even touch your um, ATM card, and then um, there's some. That's one. I get. I guess that's one of the factors that um, is um, keeping people from um, maybe using mobile banking. And then, um, well, the 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 
the statistics that I presented earlier were uh, from a survey on uh, individuals with, um, I, am, I think that's 2,500 individuals. So, well, I'm not sure if I can, that's, um, you could say that's um, representative of uh, the, the whole uh, country. But I guess it's, uh, it's still an indication that there's uh, many uh, Filipinos or, or there's a big segment of the population that is not uh, able to access uh, formal financial institutions um, and able to, um, uh, to own um, bank accounts. Um, it's, it's also maybe an indication of uh, there's that uh, people still save money at home. They, I guess, especially for those uh, uh, from the low-income groups, they save money at home, and um, they they feel that um, uh, they don't have the necessary requirements to to open a bank account and uh, or to get a loan. Um, so there's still this um, barriers to to getting, to accessing financial products or services. Um, yeah, that. Thank you, Ms. Mao. Any other comments from Dr. Serafika or Dr. Kimba? Um, I'm just uh, basing this on uh, decades of uh, or really old literature, but I think it still applies when it comes to anything that deals with communications. Uh, reliability is so important. So if you are not sure whether your, your message will be successfully transmitted, uh, you'd rather not, um, what do you call this, uh, utilize a partic particular technology. And so this is more important because you're dealing with money. So if you have hear all these uh, uh, stories, horror stories of of uh, transfers or or delays or whatever, I think uh, you know this contributes to the lack of confidence in using a particular uh, payment system. So maybe it's a contributing factor. Thank you, Dr. Serafika. Dr. Kimba, would you like to add something? I think it was mentioned earlier that last week we were in a very intensive uh, workshop on platform economy, and I uh, I remember one of my present one of my slides in that workshop was that uh, Indonesia was is considered a Twitter capital of the world. So it's I think the case is, um, but despite that. Um, they're very connected also, similar to the Philippines, but despite that, they have not translated that um, connectivity in the, on internet into something that produces value, something where they can use that uh, connection for business or for, um, or for other things. And so I guess it's not really an, uh, something that is uh, just an issue for, for the Philippine, Filipino. So it's, it can also be observed in, in other uh, countries where there's high connectivity, where there's a high access to the internet, um, there's a lot of um, participation in social networks, but the participation in the online economy and the digital economy does not translate to something that creates value similar to what we see in Indonesia. Um, why is that so? That thing uh, we need to probe further and to study. Well, I mean, what are what's the similarity between the cultural or or other aspects between the Filipinos and the Indonesians, such that it we are behaving the same way? I, I'm also not sure about that. Thank you for your comments. Other questions from our participants? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Kevin Go, um, PhD student from the same school as uh, Dr. Kimba from Grips. Sa Japan po. Uh, my question is for, uh, for Dr. Kimba lang, for, just for curious, out of curiosity, um, is the TESDA looking into how it can use its online platform at least to maybe utilize it for K-12 programs where a lot of the TIVET are being done, or a, there are a lot of TIVETs being done right now, and maybe it can be used also as modules, extra modules for students, or even for possible training of teachers? Dr. Kimba? 
I think it's being used to train the trainers in the Tibet, right? Yeah. So the, the, I think in one of the slides that I mentioned, it's actually one of the higher um, courses where there, there are a lot of people enrolling. So you, you train to become a Tibet trainer. But um, beyond uh, the Tibet uh, circle, it hasn't really um, gone out of that. And mainly because I think it's not really part of the, the objective of the test, the online program. But what I think should be done is that the, the education sector should l explore other uh, modes of um, delivering uh, education services. So not just really, um, for, uh, so TESDA is in, in a way um, pushing the, the, the boundaries by um, using ICT. And I think um, the education sector should also look into doing the same thing. Uh, we hear about the open universities in, so we see that that's also happening in the, in that other side of the, the educational services spectrum. But what about the the basic education? Um, that one, uh, I still, I I'm still not sure about uh, uh, how uh, technology is uh, being adopted in, in that area. Thank you, Dr. Kimba. Other questions, please. Questions? <laughs> okay. Okay, doc. Uh, okay, Mr. Augustine. Dr. Uh, Sirafika, um, on trade in relation to technology, uh, we have now the uh, war between the uh, U.S. and uh, China with respect to trade. We do not know the future. But uh, these two countries are the leading uh, technology leaders uh, in the world today. Uh, in, in the, can you enlighten us? They're, they have another war, tech war. For example, the 5G of Huawei. Can you enlighten us on this? And what would be the effect uh, in the Philippines, especially that uh, this company is present in the Philippines? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agustin. Dr. Uh, Serafica? Okay, sure. <laughs> Maybe the others would like to give their comments. See, I'm uh, on agriculture now. Uh, what would be the appropriate uh, technology for farmers, uh, like Israel, for example? We have here a lecture before on Israel. Their agriculture is high tech in the Philippines, what would be the appropriate technology for farmers so that we can, do, well, we have the mantra in, a PDP, uh, in our Philippine development, in inclusiveness. But how do you apply this to agriculture? <laughs> Anyone? Uh, anyone, though. Sir, maybe the, <laughs> the, the, our, our guest who's developing a digital platform for agriculture can, can assist, but... Yes, uh, please. Yes, please. Because uh, we're hungry for this. Eh? What is the, uh, what's the technology? How do we develop technologically? Uh, we're graduating. We're graduating from the plow, right? We would like to move now to what? Uh, we're still in that... Probably we're not yet the third revolution because how do we plow the field now? Oh, there's a solar, you say, but how do we apply it? Sir, can you please use the microphone? Kindly <laughs> help us in this year. Yeah, I think there's such thing as, as uh, smart agriculture right now. 
Okay, we're in you monitor everything. We're in that allows you to maximize resources like water. Uh, you can really do science based uh, science based um, technologies. Like you would know what type of fertilizers we're gonna do. You analyze continuously the nutrients in your soil. I think that's a, that's really eventually the 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 way to go. And I think uh, within our universities, a lot of uh, uh, we, in, in the country, there's a lot of researches on, on smart uh, agriculture um, right now. So I think that the government really have to have to uh, support uh, support that one. But in relation to what we're developing, uh, I'm in the Logistics Institute, so we're focusing really more now on the developing development of the system that would connect the farmers to to, to the consumers uh, directly. Uh, you're right, uh, it will involve development of the system, so it's part of the whole thing that we're working on. We're looking at also the logistics, the cold, the cold chain system, the warehousing and everything. And eventually that system becomes also a platform for, for at least for the, uh, under the plans of the company, that system becomes also a platform for financing, for fi financing uh, and technology dissemination and support to to the agricultural uh, sector, but that is on the third phase. Our first phase is just on sales, on 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 on, uh, on, on sales, on logistics, and there's another one I forgot, and then uh, on, on trading, and then the second phase is on uh, is on warehousing, and there's another one, and then the third phase is on finan fi financing support, loans, and uh, uh, and technology support, and uh, there's another one. So it's it's going to be three phases, but we're just starting on the. And the first one. That's why I was asking, because the, the main question that's always bugging us is, uh, how come e-commerce has not been applied in, in Agri? If you look at Shopee, if you look at Lazada, you don't see Agri products there. So uh, for us to develop it properly, we, we have something in mind, but we might, we might be missing something. So uh, that's, that's one thing that we're looking at right now. Assuming that we, the company is willing to develop the whole ecosystem, are we still missing something? So, because no one has yet gone into, into it, at least here, lo here locally. Yeah, that's why I asked the question earlier. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us, Dr. Seraf Serafika. I also remembered uh, last year, uh, one of our speakers, Dr. Dadios, actually focused on uh, smart agriculture as well. So, mm -hmm. and we had another. I, I think. He, we had another speaker from the U.S. who talked about vertical farming. So, yeah, I think you, we also have to strike the right balance between, because there's still a lot of um, labor in the agricultural sector. So, it's not completely a shift towards automation, but maybe just striking the right balance. Yeah, that's, that's really an often asked question. Thank you so much for uh, those um, insights. I think uh, since there's no more questions from the uh, participants, uh, let's call it a day. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and uh, hope to see you in our uh, future um, in our forthcoming events. By the way, may we before we let you go, may we request you to please fill up the survey form uh, given to you this. Uh,